Uh, good morning, everybody. This is uh, Olga uh, Schwartz, and um, uh, our today's talk for the Society of Phenomenology of Religious Experience is uh, by Yona Taipale, uh, who is uh, lecturing from uh, Helsinki. Uh, Yona is the author of the book that we all were reading um, in the reading group at the Society. Uh, which is uh, Phenomenology and Embodiment uh, by uh, Northwestern University Press. And uh, so it is very, very exciting really to have Yona lecturing um, on uh, uh, intersubjectivity and specifically on anonymity, right, uh, Yona? Okay. So thank you. I'm passing now the screen to you. Okay. Thank you very much. So, so uh, once more, I'm delighted about the invitation to give a lecture and I look forward to discussing the issues uh, with you after the after the talk in particular so so I prepared this uh, this talk about uh, 45 minutes is, is that fine and then um, we can have a discussion later on and if there's something you can you're free to interrupt me and just ask uh, for specifications in the in the during the talk as well but all the difficult questions might be addressed in the in the end. No. So, uh, so Husserl's uh, philosophy contains various dynamically interrelated concepts of intersubjectivity. Already, the horizontal structure of perception, tacitly even if emptily, implicates potential other perceivers, such that the experiential environment appears as being there for anyone. So uh, I will elsewhere call this uh, a priori intersubjectivity, and this is from the Northwestern book that uh, Olga mentioned. Second, in the face-to-face -face encounter, the singular other is present concretely in the flesh, and the environment accordingly appears as being there for, not just for anyone, but also more specifically for us. Thirdly, through repeated interactions, the structural intersubjectivity becomes sedimented and the implicated others are increasingly specified as co-members of a we. The resulting intergenerational we intersubjectivity is expressed in the fact that not just our perceptual environment, but also our familiar cultural environment appears as being there for anyone. In comparison to the a priori intersubjectivity, here the notion of anyone has a more limited sense, however, covering not just anyone, but any normal co-member of the community. My normal we, my transcendental we, a transcendentale wir, as Husserl puts it. In the latter, the implicated co-constituting others are not just world-constituting, but home-world-constituting. Namely, potential others capable of experiencing not just the same spatio-temporal environment, which is there for anyone in the wider sense, but also the same familiar world of historical and cult cultural meanings. So what Husserl calls open intersubjectivity covers the first and the third form, namely both the structural experience referencing to possible co-perceivers and concretized experience referencing, referencing to co-members of the respective we. This is another way of saying that opening the subjectivity both precedes and is transformed by relations of empathy. I have elsewhere underlined the necessity of distinguishing these two aspects of opening the subjectivity. As I see it, the three forms of intersubjectivity are neither mutually exclusive nor do they necessarily overlap. In face-to-face -face encounters, others are introduced as particular and singular subjects, yet they may simultaneously be, uh, sorry, yet they may simultaneously, more or less tacitly, appear as exemplars or tokens of anyone, or as co-members of our community and tradition. Likewise, when having an intimate discussion with someone, for instance, we know that the social setting is nonetheless perceivable to anybody, and intelligible to our culture of peers. We are then never altogether surprised if someone else 
tells us later on that, uh, that she saw us chatting in private. The exclusive social situation might not be fully graspable from the outside, to be sure, yet both the spatiotemporal setting, seeing two living beings together, for instance, and the typical cultural indications, for instance, looked like they're having an intimate conversation, these are still graspable to any potential passerby. Moreover, when realizing that we ourselves are currently seen in a particular manner by this singular other with whom we are conversing, at the same time we are more or less implicitly aware of ourselves as bodily beings perceivable by anybody and as human beings whose actions are understandable by our communal co-members and peers. We are always more or less tacitly open to these possibilities. We know them in the back of our minds, as it were. There is always the possibility that further perceivers show up, and it is this openness that the above discussed uh, concept of open intersubjectivity conveys. So, <clears throat> in the present talk, I won't be going into the constitutional relations between the different forms of intersubjectivity in more detail. I've done this elsewhere, uh, at least partly. Instead, I will focus on the central feature of open intersubjectivity namely the tacit referencing to potential others. More specifically, I want to challenge the idea that these potential others, these co-constitutors, are altogether anonymous and non-particularized. What I have in mind is not merely the well-documented and widely scrutinized issue that in, that in Husserl's account the implicated others are also discussed in terms of being co-members of one's community or home comrades at different levels. And this issue has been discussed uh, widely by Anthony Steinbock and others. Instead, my main point is that the implicated others, be they co-perceivers or co-members, are specified associatively and are not altogether faceless, as it were. Differently put, I will argue both that, sorry, differently put, I will argue that both the self and the people we actually reciprocate and interact with play the part of primal institutors of the anyone, and that the tacitly implicated others hence arise both structurally from the basis uh, of our subjective experience of potentialities and associatively from the basis of our earlier interactive experiences. In short, the way we co-posit others echoes our past, and this questions the anonymity of the anyone. So my talk is divided into three sections. First, I will outline the concept of open intersubjectivity in more detail. Second, I will examine the specifications of the implicated anyone uh, that arise uh, from our subjective experiential buildup, thereby highlighting both uh, the asymmetric and the embodied nature of open intersubjectivity. Thirdly, I will outline specifications of the in implicated anyone that arise from our previous interactive experiences. As I will show, the idea of completely anonymous co-constitutors is an idealization. My aim lies not in an attempt to refute the central transcendental nature of open intersubjectivity, however, but rather in revealing novel aspects of the dynamic, temporal and sedimented nature of the latter. Importing insights from phenomenology development of psychology and psychoanalysis, I will discuss the asymmetric structure of social perception and the sedimentation of experience and challenge the assumption of the anonymity of the anyone. By elaborating, uh, uh, so by, I will conclude by uh, elaborating the sense in which our concrete relationships with others, relationships of empathy namely, amount to a fulfillment and unfulfillment of open intersubjectivity. So let me begin by outlining the sense of uh, open intersubjectivity. So the first section is uh, titled Structural Openness to Others. And I start with two quotes. Uh, the first one is from Husserl and from the, from the C manuscripts dealing with time consciousness. Husserl writes, quote, already each of my perceptions constantly inseparably includes others as co-subjects, as co-constituting." End of quote. 
And the second quote is from Merleau-Ponty. Uh, he writes in a more, perhaps more eloquent language. I do not have to search very far from others. I find them in my experience, lodged in the hallows that show what they see and what I fail to see. Our experiences thus have lateral relationships of truth, altogether each possessing clearly what is secret in the others. In a combined functioning, we form a totality which moves towards enlightenment and completion." End of quote. So, as I'm sure you're aware, two tendencies are commonly distinguished uh, with regard to Husserl's theory of intersubjectivity. Uh, and then Zahavi has, has, has made a significant contributions in this respect. So the better known uh, approach is explicated in the, in the Cartesian meditations, which for a long time was Husserl's only published text concerning the problem of intersubjectivity. In this approach, Husserl starts from an abstract layer of experience, the infamous sphere of ownness or Eigenheitssphere, uh, attempting to clarify how the world thus conceived is precisely an abstraction, while aiming to show, ex negativo as it were, how intersubjectivity is actually there already. For a long time, this approach was misread as an explication of how our experience of others, empathy, temporally emerges, thereby for forgetting that the sphere of fullness is precisely that, an abstraction. It is a thought experiment designed to outrule itself, so to speak. The other approach more directly promotes the transcendental dimension of intersubjectivity and explicitly argues that, constitutionally speaking, empathy is not the fundamental form of intersubjectivity. Pursuing this approach, Husserl sets off from the horizontal structure of experience and views empathy, that is to say, our actual experience of others, as a disclosing accomplishment, enthüllendes Leisten, which builds upon and reveals the underlying open intersubjectivity. So in the present context, I will discuss the latter approach exclusively. As the above quotes uh, uh, illustrate, the starting point of Husserl's phenomenological examination of intersubjectivity lies in the realization of the fundamental openness of subjectivity. Instead of initially discovering others out there, as it were, and then ex nihilo, finding its way into their experiences, subjectivity already harbors intentional implications to possible co perceivers As Husserl puts it, quote, thus subjectivity expands into intersubjectivity, or rather, more precisely, does not expand, but transcendental subjectivity just understands itself better. It understands itself as a primordial monad that intentionally carries within itself other monads." End of quote. For Husserl, intersubjective self-constitution is not primarily a matter of expanding. This would suggest that there is initially something like non-intersubjective subjectivity that gradually expands into something more comprehensive and this interpretation would coincide with the classical reading of the sphere of ownness, for instance. Instead, intersubjective self-constitution is a matter of enhanced self-understanding, which is to say that intentional implications to potential others are to be located within oneself. These implications provide subjectivity with an intersubjective structure, regardless of the presence or absence of actual others. To quote Bernard Waldenfels, the other appears within myself and on my side before appearing in front of me. End of quote. Now, Husserl illustrates the concept of uh, opening the subjectivity by noting that the world appears as being there for anyone. Uh, the German words are für jedermann da seien. He introduces the idea in connection with this theory of perceptual appresentation or co-presentation. So the basic idea is, is known to all phenomenologists. Whenever we perceive something, like a chair for instance, certain aspects of the object gain prominence and appear in the foreground, but the, inten but the intentional object also includes aspects that are currently hidden or unthematic. 
quote, while the surface is immediately given, I mean more than, than it offers, end of quote. This so-called surplus is immediately, uh, sorry, this so-called surplus essentially pertains to the thing as intended. To see a surface of, or an aspect is to see a surface of something or an aspect of something. That is to say, the perceptual object essentially has an anticipate, uh, is an anticipatory unity, which is not exhausted by any particular perception. Uh, Husser puts it in the analysis lectures, the 20s, quote, perception is a constant pretension to accomplish something that, by its very nature, it is not in a position to accomplish. End of quote. Merleau-Ponty uh, discusses the same issue and, uh, and, and phrases it by saying that perception is a violent act. So it takes more than what is actually given to it. In the crisis, Husserl writes, quote, implied in the particular perception of the thing is a whole horizon of non-active and yet co-functioning manners of appearance and synthesis of validity, open or implicated intentionalities, end of quote. The sense of surprise is illustrative, illustrated here. When we move and look at a chair from another angle, for instance, or touch its surface, we are not surprised to find that there were aspects to, the, to it that were not perceived from our previous standpoint. This is because we already apprehended or associatively anticipated alternative appearances of the thing. To be more precise, we may be surprised about how the backside of the chair looks or how the chair feels when sitting on it, but we are not surprised about the fact that there was a hither side to the chair or about the fact that there was something that came to support our body. If we were surprised about such features, this would imply phenomenologically that we first experienced the chair as illusory, for instance, uh, something that only appears from our present standpoint and merely visually, and then realized that it is, a, it, it is a real object after all, that can also, also be seen from elsewhere, touched, etc. This is not how we normally experience chairs uh, and other objects, of course. To associatively anticipate alternative perceptions of the object pertains to experiencing the object as something real. So it's part of the uh, grasping the reality. Moreover, we are not surprised to find the chair being also perceivable to other perceivers. Quite on the contrary, this possibility too pertains to the sense of real objects. Experiencing something as being exclusively there for me means to experience it as, as an imaginary or illusory object and not as a real, actually perceived thing. For example, when I see a chair in front of me, I do not experience it as being there only for me, only, only for my actual and my potential perceptions. If I did, that would again mean that I experience it as an illusion, as a hallucination, or as a figment of my imagination. To say that I experience the chair as actually being there, that I experience it as something real, implies an openness to the possibility that it can also be perceived by other potential perceivers. Importantly, this is not just a formal and rather obvious requirement or a necessary condition, if you will, but something that can be experienced, something experiential. Our openness to potential co-perceivers is indicated by the fact that we are never surprised to realize that others too are capable of seeing the chair that we see, whereas by contrast, in general, we are surprised if they do not seem to be capable of this. A lack of surprise is owing to the fact that we already tacitly constituted the chair as being there for anyone. Now, the references to these potential co-perceivers do not have to be explicit or thematic, however, and on most occasions they certainly are not. The being there for anyone is rather related to the sense of the object as something real, and is mainly in unexpected cases where a tacit assumption concerning perceivability by anyone becomes prominent and perhaps challenged. A 
as long as we interact with people that are more or less similar to us, the object's perceivability to anyone is present not, not as a subjective anticipation, but as an objective fact, a trait of the thing itself, if you will. If we then enter into communication with a blind person, for instance, the tacit assumption of that anyone can see the chair is compromised. In this fashion, the horizontal structure of perception involves references to open infinity of possible co-perceptions, which are not clearly divided between my perception and those of others. In other words, when perceiving a chair, my pre-reflective experience neither comes in the form I can perceive the chair from other standpoints as well, nor in the form others can perceive the chair from other standpoints. To be sure, the apprehending is lived through by me. After all, as Husserl puts it, transcendental intersubjectivity is something for me. But the subjectivity of the apprehended appearances remains open, undecided, as it were. That is to say, the environment originally appears neither as being there for me exclusively, nor as being there for me and others, but as the, being there for anyone, anonymously, without self and other being thematically separated. And this, I end, this, end the first section with a quote from Rousseau. And this is, uh, this is from the second intersubjectivity volume. Quote, everything object-like that stands before my eyes in experience and primarily in perception has an apperceptive horizon of possible experiences, my own and those of others. Every appearance that I have is from the very beginning part of an open, endless, although not explicitly realized totality of possible appearances of the same. And the subjectivity of these appearances is the open in the subjectivity. End of quote. So the next, uh, the second uh, section is uh, titled Asymmetry and Anonymity. And here again, I uh, <clears throat> repeat myself by starting with two quotations. The first is from Husserl, uh, and this is from Husserlian uh, 42. Quote, what is valid for me is valid for any, anyone, end of quote. And Melo-Ponty writes, quote, Despite the fact that we accept others as witnesses, that we make our views accord with theirs, we are still the ones who set the terms of the agreement. The transpersonal field remains dependent on our, on our own." End of quote. Rather than being a particular intentional relation to others, opening to subjectivity is an essential feature of our intentional world relation. Uh, using also the term transcendental empathy, Husserl claims that before emerging as objects of our intentions, others are apprehended as co-constituting transcendental others, uh, uses the term transcendental and anderen, or pure others, puren anderen, namely potential others who as yet have no worldly sense, as Husserl also puts it. Opening to subjectivity, therefore, doesn't imply an experience of sharing. The environment appears as being perceivable by anyone, yet not anyone in particular, but anonymously by irgenwärtige alter egos, so any alter egos whatsoever. In other words, the tacitly anticipated co-perceivers or fellow subjects remain unspecified, anonymous. However, even if the anyone is no one in particular, Certain specifications concerning the implicated co-perceivers arise from the basis of the asymmetric structure of intersubjectivity. First of all, the perceptual environment appears as palpable, touchable, visible, audible, and olfactory, olfactorily perceivable to me, and the implicated co-perceivers are, uh, are thus tacitly specified as embodied subjects as experiencing beings with sensible faculties. Anyone, as Husserl notes, is a subject of a lived body. So when it comes to an experience of the natural world, no matter how broad the scope of the anyone might be, it is nonetheless limited to bodily sensing subjects with a spatial temporal location. Rather than anyone, it might therefore be more fitting to talk about anybody. 
Secondly, moreover, the asymmetric structure of open intersubjectivity gives rise to further specifications related to one's own subjective perceptual setup. What is initially anticipated as being perceivable to anyone is the environment as it appears to me. To quote Husserl's uh, uh, at first glance uh, striking words, and this is from Cartesian Meditations, quote, I am the norm for all other human beings, end of quote. Of course, rather than referring to himself exclusively, Husserl is here making a formal indication of the constitutive role of primordial subjectivity in intersubjective perception. As he puts it elsewhere, quote, what is imminently valid for me is likewise expected to be valid for my fellow humans. This is how I see them as others, end of quote. To illustrate, for the congenitally blind, the implicated co-perceivers of a chair do not initially include seeing subjects. They cannot. Others are initially represented as co-perceivers to what one already perceives, which is another way of saying that open intersubjectivity is rooted in associative anticipations arising from the basis of one's subjective experiential setup. Importantly, the affective, axiological, cognitive, normative, and practical associations likewise carry over to our presentations. Sensuous perceptions are permeated by various feelings and evaluations. We not only hear, but like or dislike what we hear. We not only see chairs, but intend to use them. And we not only perceive actions, but also evaluate and normatively assess them. The essential point here is that the co-posited others are expected to confirm the intersubjective availability of such features as well. So just consider looking at a chair and feeling disgusted by its uh, cheap uh, 80s style look. And you can kind of uh, imagine me writing this in my, in my apartment. What you posit uh, as being there for anyone is not just a chair, material chair, but a corny chair. And you're surprised if someone, else, someone instead judges the chair as decorative or beautiful. To use another example, consider exiting a movie theater after seeing a comedy that you liked a lot. Before reflectively distinguishing between assessments of the objective value of the movie on the one hand, and assessments based on your personal preferences and your affective mood on the other, we tend to simply consider the object itself, namely the movie, as funny and entertaining. Phenomenologically, this is another way of saying that you tacitly, and indeed naively, assume that anyone can confirm this. And hence you are initially, even if only fleetingly, surprised when overhearing some other viewers judging the movie as a boring piece of rubbish instead. What interests us here is, is how your surprise reveals your underlying tacit assumptions. You implicitly expected that what you consider to be fun and entertaining appears, as, as, uh, appears in this manner to every, anyone. And the disappointment of that expectation is what I would say constitutes your feeling of surprise. So in this manner, my perception of the chair, for instance, implicates not just potential co-perceivers, but also co-evaluators, co-users, co-judgers, and so on. To modify Merleau-Ponty is not on visibility and audibility, also the practical and aesthetic value of the object, uh, as you experience it, initially seems to dwell in the object itself. And so whenever someone doesn't share our effective take on the object, we initially tend to assume that the other doesn't, just simply doesn't see or judge the object correctly. Realizing the subjective nature of our assessment comes only after that. It may arrive fast indeed, but it's not there from the outset. To implicate the anyone is to anticipate confirmation of our perception of the object and the disappointment of that tacit anticipation motivates our occasional and more or less extensive feeling of surprise. So thirdly, such disappointments make us increasingly aware of the subjective nature of our anticipations, the underlying self-other distinction, and hence also affect various transformations vis-a-vis -vis open in the subjectivity. For example, the perceived object is 
Initially taken to be there for anyone, not only as a spatial, temporal, practical, and aesthetic object, but uh, one that also incorporates tradition bound meanings. It may then happen, as it often does, that we realize that someone else, uh, say a representative of another culture, perceives the same material entity or same body movement, uh, but either doesn't fully grasp its meaning or grasp the meaning quite differently. In this case, our tacit anticipations are partly confirmed and partly disappointed. Point, partly disappointed. The other confirms to our expectations of the chairs vis being visible to anyone, so a priori in the subjectivity, but disappoints our expectation of its meaning being graspable to anyone, we in the subjectivity. That is to say, through interacting with people dif with different bodily perceptual setups, different aesthetic tastes, and different cultural backgrounds, an in-group, out-group distinction is introduced into the anyone. Consequently, in Husserl's words, quote, not all reduced in a transcendental manner are co-bearers of the world that is pre-given as my world and that we have as pre-given, end of quote. In the course of time, our experiences are thus sedimented and the tacitly implicated anyone, the transcendental we, is specified as the open community of home comrades. Heimgenossen is the German word. It's still open, yet not just to anyone, but exclusively to our home comrades. And when such anticipations are disappointed, we refer back to the more broad anyone of the a priori intersubjectivity. And these are, of course, uh, subjects to, to change and they develop dynamically, but the structures are there, I would say, each experience. <clears throat> However, these uh, three general specifications do not really challenge the anonymity of the implicated others. In other words, even if the latter is specified as anybody equipped with similar enough perceptual faculties as mine, so a priori intersubjectivity, or as anybody with an experiential background similar enough to ours, we intersubjectivity, the implicated others are nonetheless just any co-perceivers or fellow subjects who satisfy these general requirements. They may remain altogether faceless and insignificant to us. Yet the tacitly implicated others harbor an associative depth which motivates reconsidering the claim of anonymity. And, and this I will be clarifying in the third section, which is titled The Depth of the Anyone. So uh, I start uh, with a quote from Husserl. Quote, from the start, the grasped sense implies determinations that have not yet been experienced with this object but which nevertheless are of a known type, insofar as they refer back to earlier analogous experiences concerning other objects." End of quote. And, uh, and, uh, and another quote, and this is from Husserlian 42, anything that is concealed, each tacit validity, operates from associative and apperceptive, apperceptive depths. These depths enable the Freudian method and are presupposed by it." End of quote. As bodily expressive beings, we also constitute ourselves as being perceivable by anyone. Having assumed to be alone, we may be surprised when being told that we were in fact seen. We may be surprised about others' assessment of and reactions to our actions and doings. Yet what is not surprising to us, by contrast, is the realization that we and our doings are and were perceivable. When it comes to the claim of anonymity, the case of self-experience, uh, I find particularly illuminating. Just consider the case of shame. To be sure, shame is a social emotion that involves assessing one's action as, as being actually or potentially witnessed by others. It's worth noting that when being witness doing something disgraceful, the significance of the witness is crucial. So what matters is, for instance, uh, his or her personal, social or contextual relevance. That is to say, 
It clearly matters whether the witness of one's action is a bird, a dog, an infant, a teenager, an adult, a friend, a colleague, one's own child, one's spouse, one's parent, an unknown pie bastard, bypasser, a person one wishes to get acquainted with, etc. So the intensity of shame, I would say, correlates not just with the nature of the witnessed action, but also with the nature of the witness. The presence of certain witnesses might not inflict shame on you at all. If that is true, we can argue that, that the witnesses in the presence of whom you feel shame are not just anyone. Keeping this in mind, consider the case of feeling shame while being alone. Surely, you might not be explicitly thinking of anyone in particular, but the tacitly apprehended co-perceivers of your doings, the implicated others in whose potential presence you feel shame, are not just anyone, but people that somehow matter to you. Here it makes all the difference who the co-posited others are. They are not anonymous. Now, one might here naturally object that feeling shame while being alone is a special case. After all, what is at stake is a social emotion, which by definition highlights the role and significance of particular others. But while the anonymity of the anyone might be challenged in this case, in many other cases it might not be. What about the more neutral forms of experience, one might ask? Now, on the one hand, we can reply to this by saying that while in this example the implicated anyone may be specified in detail, perhaps even personified, in other kinds of self-experience the anyone might remain more anonymous. The degree of anonymity is indeed case-specific. There's no denying this. On the other hand, the idea of faceless, completely anonymous co-perceivers seems to rely on an idealization. The notion seems to apply only to cases where the affective, axiological, and normative dimensions have been brushed aside. To be sure, co-positing the anyone relates to what we thematically posit. In the case of finding an action, our own action, or someone else's action, virtuous or disgraceful, the implicated anyone comprises the co-assessors who are expected to be able to confirm our assessment. In the case of perceiving material objects, are chairs. Again, the implicated others are co-perceivers. The crucial question is, are they ever merely that? When a chair gains prominence in my experience, it does so for a reason. I might feel tired and the chair hence attracts me as a place to sit. So the practical aspect might be highlighted. I might be in the middle of a move to a new, new apartment and the chair I see in the showcase of a department store they catch my attention as something decorative, so the aesthetic uh, aspect might be heightened. To be sure, the chair may also gain prominence due to the perceptual setup itself. Just consider seeing an empty chair in the middle of an empty theater stage. And the, and the chair can also stand out in more theoretical circumstances, like when, when one is measuring the param parameters of the furniture. In cases of the latter type, the co-perceivers that we tacitly expect to confirm our perceptions of the chair as an object or of this or that size may remain quite neutral, faces and anonymous, assuming for the sake of the argument that we then manage to keep the affective and aesthetic dimensions completely at bay. However, first of all, such cases, as I say, it count as except, except, exceptions rather than as the rule. Perception is only seldom effectively neutral, and for sure, self-experiences are hardly ever of such kind. Moreover, given that the affective, axiological, and normative are mostly, if not always, intertwined with the perceptual, what is clear and fairly explicit in the case of normative judgments, the case of shame, for instance, is not completely absent in external perceptual experiences either. The way in which you co-posit the anyone is not unaffected by our past experiences. Our valuations and passions are not just not, not all inborn but inherited. And as for self-experience, we habituate the ways in which our spontaneous expressions, actions, reactions, evaluations, intentions, and perceptions are greeted and received in our surroundings. 
and we get used to the ways in which they are confirmed or challenged. For, instance, for example, coming from an environment where we have been treated with respect and encouragement, we tend to anticipate similar manners and patterns of reacting from anyone we encounter, and more easily enter into new situations with more optimistic prospects. By contrast, coming from an environment where we have been repeatedly discouraged, played down or humiliated, we tend to anticipate similar manners of reacting from anyone we encounter and tend to be more, more reserved. Our past figures in our self-experience, in our experience of the things and the environment, and in our experience of other people in the form of more or less tacit anticipations, the way in which anyone, namely typical co-perceivers, is implicated is therefore dependent not just on the case, but also on our earlier interactions. In other words, anyone comes with an associative depth. Now, Husserl touches this uh, depth in his account of typification. He argues that the ways in which we categorize things, environments, other people, situations and actions, builds on our past experiences of particular exemplars. While accounting for the constitution of objectivity, Husserl discusses the issue in rather general terms without distinguishing between type control related to inanimate objects and type control related to animate objects. He assumes, in other words, that typification emerges similarly in both cases. Husserl doesn't discuss our experience of other people in connection with typification, which generalizes the impression that the process of learning to typify women and men, for instance, is not structurally any different from the process of learning to distinguish between plants and stones. Both kinds of distinctions indeed arise from our past experiences of particular plants, stones, women and men. Yet when it comes to, this, uh, when it comes to the material, I find it crucial to distinguish between objects of personal significance and objects merely observed without engagement or emotion. Otherwise, as I see it, the danger is that one gets the impression that all, all the women and all the men that I have perceived, observed, and encountered equally serve as material for my typifications of women and men. That all of the individual tokens that I've come up with uh, have an equal constitutional status. Now, I consider such an assumption problematic and distorting. To be sure, Husserl's ambitious aim is to disclose the constitution of, of the objective world and thus unite the sciences, and his analysis concerning open intersubjectivity and presentation mainly serve this purpose. Given this aim, uh, Husserl's main focus vis-a-vis -vis open intersubjectivity understandably lies in the most general features of apprehended otherness, and it is like the specifications uh, regarding the anyone remain less important. Understandably so. Examples Husserl gives in this connection hence mainly portray an experience or relation to an object perceived or known. And although uh, he extensively discusses affectivity in other connections, uh, he has less to say about the affective dimensions in apresentation. So my point here is that uh, if you want to employ the Husserlian, uh, employ the Husserlian concept of uh, open intersubjectivity when descriptively theorizing our experience of others uh, for, its, uh, for its own right, and I think it's indeed a fruitful and opera, opera, operationalizable, 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 you get the idea, account of, uh, in this respect too, so I think it's kind of fruitful. Uh, but we should take a closer look at the sense and degree in which the implied others are specified. So the distinction between significant and insignificant others is relevant from the point of view of our grasp of typical co-perceivers or anyone. My point here is that the exemplars on the basis of which we have formed the idea of women, men or anybody hardly form an homogeneous set of individual tokens. Instead of all uh, having had an equal status in our experience, particular individuals have served as the primal institutors and arch archetypes for the, type, for the types in question. When it comes to the distinction between plants and stones, for instance, 
It presumably uh, is not that important which stones or which plants have serve, served as the primal institutors of the respective types. By contrast, when it comes to more complex types in respect to which the emotional dimension is highlighted, the starting point, that is to say, early development, matters a lot, lot more. As Husserl notes, <clears throat> uh, the mother is the first other. But as, I've, as far as I know, at least, he doesn't link such claims to the topics of opening the subjectivity, representation, and the animal. While omitting uh, this issue in his account of typification, however, in discussing normativity, Husserl talks about an incorporated ideal within me, das Ideal in mir. And he suggests that significant or admirable, admirably beloved uh, others constitute such inner role models and notes that the child's initial exemplaries are found in the parents. As I see it, to assume that the foundation for our understanding of anyone is equally comprised of experiences of personally insignificant and personally significant others is unconvincing. I consider it more plausible that the relevant instituting material, so to speak, mainly includes others that are or have been personally significant to me. Moreover, if I'm on the right track in this respect, it also seems convincing to assume that the temporal order vis-a-vis -vis the significant others is important. This is because the different phases of development, in different phases of development, Certain others are more significant and prominent than the rest. So to illustrate this, let me repeat that most of our effective valuations and normative categorizations are not inborn. We have grown into liking and disliking various things, into thinking that something is shameful or forbidden and so forth, so on. Many objects, actions and constellations that appear desirable for the baby are repeatedly labeled by the caregivers as dangerous, forbidden or otherwise unfitting. For example, via repetition, a toddler, toddler learns to associate the act of uh, playing with food with a forbidding parent. And of course, I mean, you might guess that the examples are, are uh, well, I have personal interest here. A child incorporates and interjects uh, uh, the mindset of her early authorities and henceforth views the world also from their viewpoint, as it were. The child's sense of guilt when do doing something forbidden might initially be rather personified in the sense of more or less explicitly linking with the blaming parent. The anyone gradually grows out of this, as it were. The act of playing with food is grasped as something forbidden, first in the eyes of the caregivers and later in the eyes of anyone. The early authorities, the caregivers, may uh, play a special role as the primal institutors of the respective affective quality, which is now assigned to the action itself, now viewed as, as, now viewed as being generally forbidden. Uh, that is to say, something that anyone would regard forbidden. So when a six-year-old child sees her little, sist little sister playing with food, she might not articulate her experience by saying that mom and dad consider that forbidden, but rather consider the forbidden quality as a characteristic of the action itself. Yet the origin of such, such qualities that the child projects to the ac action, uh, uh, the, the origin of such qualities that the child expects anyone to being able to see lies in the specific others. And moreover, the anyone inherits not just uh, moreover, the anyone inherits not just their general assessment, but also their tone, intensity, and strength. And this has been discussed in various uh, ways in uh, developmental psychology. The early authorities are thus generalized into anyone. The former serve as the primal institutors of the latter. To be sure, the personified co-presence of the interjected authorities gradually fades into the background. Uh, they become veiled by anonymity and generality and thus remain present in a disguised form. Insofar as the child interacts with many authorities in the course of her development and doesn't remain fixated on the parents, for instance, the sense of anyone develops into a rather heterogeneous 
experientially less personified and hence more flexible normative atmosphere. Normativity, of course, is just one kind of example. And in the case of perception, uh, pure sense perception, the animals might remain, as said, more anonymous. Yet our early interjections reach to the level of perceptual implications as well. As said, our perceptions are permitted by affective, axiological, practical, and normative references. Many of these remain latent or even unconscious, if you will, but this is not to say that they are not there. Even if the object of perception would be rather neutral in itself, our past introduces a load of anticipations that arise, to rephrase Husserl, not from our current experience, but from our past experiences with circumstances similar to the current ones in one way or another. Uh, the kind of emphasis in the end of the last sentence is meant to underline the fact that the experience of the chair of a chair on an empty theater stage, for instance, is associatively colored not merely by our past experience of chairs, but our past experience of theaters, performances, stages, to say nothing of the uh, possible symbolism that functions associatively below the surface of such experiences. I mean, we could say that the chair is alone, that there's a kind of sense of aloneness uh, uh, involved in the experience as well. Just as an example. In this manner, we can see that even a simple perception tends to awaken more or less consciously a whole web of associations. This introduces a depth dimension into the seemingly homogeneous and anonymous anyone whom we tacitly posit as co-witnessing the situation at hand. Although the anyone is generalized and transformed in the course of time, there is often a source that can, in principle, at least up to a certain point, be tracked down. As we saw Husserl putting it, the associative and apperceptive depths enable the Freudian method. To be sure, the more neutral the experience, the more homogeneous the co-positive anyone. On the other hand, experiences are hardly ever altogether neutral, even if tacitly uh, the affective, axiological, and normative dimensions tend to introduce non-articulated specifications to the anyone, thus giving the latter a face, as it were. The way in which we have uh, witnessed our significant others to perceive and assess the world, ways of life, activities, types of objects, actions, etc., all these figures not just in how we subjectively view the world, but also in how we co-posit the witnesses of such experiences. This is particularly clear vis-a-vis -vis the virtual confirmers of our self-experience, but insofar as simple perceptual experiences are never free from ax affective, axiological, and normative associations, it holds for them too. In this sense, more generally put, the anyone implicated in our experience echoes our past. And if so, its anonymity and generality may often, at least to a large extent, be seen as a disguise. So I have a, a very brief uh, concluding section. Uh, so I have here focused on the Husserlian notion of opening the subjectivity, more precisely on the tacit tra structural referencing to potential others, and challenged the related claim of anonymity. I tried to suggest that the way in which we tacitly co-posit to anyone grows out of and links back to our past interactions and object relations, underlining the distinction between significant and insignificant others. I argued that our tacit experiential implications to co-perceivers and fellow humans are hardly ever completely neutral, as they carry associative references to our past interactions with significant others. To consider the implicated anyone, literally, as just anyone accordingly seems to rely on an idealization which hardly characterizes our everyday experiences. In this manner, I've tried to motivate reconsidering the assumption of the anonymity of the animal. If true, I think this claim has uh, some significant uh, implications. So for one, uh, it enables considering experiences of empathy and concrete interactions in terms of partial fulfillment of the underlying in the subjectivity. And this uh, I uh, made some uh, 
uh, gestures towards this idea in the book that you've been reading. More generally, a phenomenological scrutiny of the asymmetric structure of intersubjectivity opens new perspectives to the philosophical analysis and explications of cultural exchange, intersubjective and intercommunal conflicts, social discrimination, and even racism, just to name a few topics. Moreover, furthering and uh, consolidating the communication between phenomenology, developmental psychology, and, and the psychodynamic tradition, uh, I find particularly useful for, for all the parties. But when it, so when it comes to the side of phenomenology, as I hope to have illustrated in this talk, the exchange can challenge and hence motivate reconsidering certain claims and assumptions, some of which are simply owing to differing research interests, to be sure, but some to more substantial disagreements and tensions. Thank you. <laughs>